الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتابة بيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم Brother Chairman and students here at the International Islamic University in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Our subject is entitled Palestine in the Quran and our first observation is that although the word Palestine like the word Jerusalem or alia in Latin does not appear in the Quran the subject is most certainly in the Quran where is Palestine located what are the frontiers of Palestine what is its status in history what is its destiny are questions which all of mankind are interested today and all of mankind would like to hear the answers not just you who are studying here at the International Islamic University the people in France which has now become Zionist France <laughs> The people of Switzerland, we have a student from Switzerland right in front of me. The people of the United States, the people of India, of China. Very importantly, the people of Russia would like to know what does Islam have to say? What are the answers to these questions in the Quran? And in the limited time that we have with us tonight, we attempt to provide the answers from the Quran and from he who was sent to teach the Quran, namely Nabi Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet Muhammad. There is a methodology for the study of the Quran and the Hadith and we do not have the time to explain the methodology that we use today but I wrote a book entitled An Islamic View of Gog and Magog Ya'juj and Ma'juj in the modern world and my books are somewhere outside on a table that book is also there thank you Jamal oh you brought me the Bahasa never mind <laughs> in that book an Islamic view of Gog and Magog in the modern world there is a chapter on methodology so you will excuse me for not spending time on that subject now Using that methodology, we now attempt to answer the questions. While the word Palestine, and as Daniel Pipes continues to remind us ad nauseum, that the word Jerusalem 
does not appear in the Quran. The Quran most certainly speaks about a land, a special land, which it describes as Al Ardul Muqaddasa. It does so in Surah Al Ma'idah, Surah number 5, entitled The Table Laden with Food. When I speak, I'm not only speaking to you. I'm also speaking to large numbers of people outside who are not familiar with terminology, so please excuse me. <coughs> a table laden with food. The disciples of Jesus, Nabi Isa alayhi salam, asked him to pray to the Lord God and ask him to send down a table laden with food, mean touched with fire, ta'kulun nar. And Allah responded by sending down that table laden with food. Every Christian knows about that. And this chapter of the Quran is named Al Ma'ida after that event. And in this chapter of the Quran, Nabi Musa alayhi salam, the Prophet Moses, speaks to the Israelite people and he says I believe this is ayah number 24 Oh my people, come on come on, rise up and let us enter and take control of the Holy Land which Allah has given to you which Allah katab Allah Ya qawmi dkulu al-arda allati katab Allah lakum O my people enter into the Holy Land which Allah has given to you which Allah has given to you and so Palestine in the Quran is Al Ardul Muqaddasa, the Holy Land. It is also known as the land which is specially blessed by Allah. At the beginning of Surah Al Isra, which is Surah number 17, the miraculous nocturnal journey of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through the Samawat through the different worlds of space and time through the parallel universes the physicist who is listening will understand what we are talking about the parallel worlds of space and time the miraculous journey from Mecca to Jerusalem and into the parallel universes of space and time. Subhanallahi asra bi abdihi laylam min al masjid al harami ila al masjid al aqsa alladhi barakna hawla. Glory be to him who took his servant, Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, by night, took him on this miraculous journey from this sacred house of worship in Mecca built by Ibrahim alayhi salam, the Prophet Abraham to that distant one and if they don't know what is that distant one let us tell them it's the one in Jerusalem because there was no other it was only one other built by a Prophet only one other the one in Jerusalem built by Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam, the Prophet Solomon. And the Quran says, Alladhi barakna hawla, that we had blessed the land around this masjid. And so, it's not only the holy land, al abdul muqaddasa, it is also the blessed land. Blessed land. There are 
other references in the Quran to this land, but let's move on. You will find all of this information in my book entitled Jerusalem in the Quran. This is the Bahasa, the English one is outside, and we're about to go with the Arabic one to the printry in Beirut, inshallah, soon, maybe by the end of next month. Inshallah. What is the status of this land? Palestine, the Holy Land, Jerusalem and its precincts. Well, the Quran says that Allah gave this land to Banu Israel. And it is fascinating that we don't hear CNN broadcasting that information. Could you kindly inform CNN for me? That the Quran says that Allah gave the Holy Land to the Jews? Could you kindly inform CNN and inform Al Jazeera? Because they probably don't know it. Why don't they broadcast it? How come it's not on the front page of the New York Times and the Washington Post and the French newspaper Le Monde? <laughs> Why is it not there? Why are they so afraid of the Quran? Why are they scared of the Quran? Perhaps it's because Allah has commanded us in the Quran, Wajahidhum bihi jihadan kabira and wage a mighty struggle against them. Now with nuclear weapons, now we don't even have with the Quran. Allah gave the land to them. But in the Quran, Allah points out that He gave the land to them conditionally. That's why they don't want to talk about it. The land was given to them conditionally. What are the conditions? Walakad katabna fi zabur. Is there in the Zabur, after the Torah, it is also there in the Torah, it's there in the Zabur, and now it's here in the Quran as well. And the Arda Yari Suha Ibadi Asalikum, righteous conduct on the part of those who worship the one God. That is the condition. And every time you violate that condition, see what I'll do to you. And so they entered into, into the Holy Land, Banu Israel, having crossed the sea. وَإِذْ فَرَقْنَا بِكُمُ الْبَحْرِ فَأَنْجَيْنَاكُمْ And we saved you. And we destroyed Pharaoh and his armed forces, you know, the arrogant oppressor. It happened before your very eyes. Don't you remember? And then you went and you occupied the Holy Land that Allah gave to you. And what has been the story of you? and the Holy Land, O Banu Israel. At the beginning of Surah Al-Isra, Allah speaks about that history. And He says, وَقَدَيْنَا إِلَىٰ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ فِي الْكِتَابِ لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنِ وَلَتَعَلُنَّ عُلُوًا كَبِيرًا إِلَىٰ آخِرِ الْآيَةِ all things are in Allah's knowledge. If He does not have knowledge of all things, He cannot be the Supreme Rabb and Khalik and Bari and Fatir of all creation. So yes, He has 
the knowledge of all things but he is not responsible for your conduct وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرٍ يَرَى وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرٍ يَرَى He is not responsible for our conduct. We are, but he has the knowledge. He knows the future. And he says it was written, we knew it, that you will commit facade. There are lots of crimes that one can commit. But this is the ultimate crime, facade. Fasad fil ard. This crime is like treason. It is not just to corrupt, but to corrupt you know, in order to also destroy. You are destroying human society. Destroying civilization. And so the ultimate punishment begins with banishment. And then you have the higher punishment. Cut off the hand and the feet from opposite sides. And then the last, crucify them. But do Israel, you will do that. You will commit fasad in the Holy Land, Marratain, twice. It's there in Surah Al-Isra and it actually happened. The first event of Fasad was the rewriting of the Torah. They sent me emails. Where is the evidence that the Torah has been corrupted? <laughs> Come on, give us the evidence. I got so many emails. <laughs> well, let me give you one, if you are listening. In nearly every religion in the world, lending money on interest has been prohibited. Riba. It's also prohibited in your Torah. And you know that. But you changed, not you of course, those who came before you. To put into the Torah today, that it is haram, it is prohibited for an Israelite to lend money on interest to another Israelite. Don't rip off your own brother. But it is permissible to lend money on interest to those who are not Israelites. That did not come from the one God. No. Lending money on interest is so terrible, so great an evil, and has been made haram in so emphatic a way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved the very last revelation in the Quran, the last one to come down. On the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma to declare war on the money lender. فَأَذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ إِلَىٰ آخِرِ الْآيَةِ And so you change. The Torah was changed to make halal what Allah made haram. There are many other changes of us, many others. I wrote a book many years ago entitled The Religion of Abraham and the State of Israel A View from the Quran in which I went to the Quran to locate all the changes that they had made all the changes that they had made in the Torah as a consequence of this wicked conduct of rewriting the word of Allah this fasad and fasad is of many kinds there is political fasad there is military fasad there is agricultural fasad you better pay attention to agricultural fasad there is fasad in the male female relationship there is sexual fa fasad 
As a consequence of this first facade, Marratain twice, this is the first one, what did Allah do to you? The land was given to you, but it was given conditionally. You violated the condition. So he sent an army. He calls them Ibadan Lana. Ibadan Lana. Uli Ba'sin Shadid. A Babylonian army that worship idols, that worship the sun and moon and stars. Ibadan Lana. But powerful, military powerful. And they came and they threw you out of the Holy Land and took you into Babylon as slaves. How come if the land was given to you, how come you were thrown out of the land by divine decree? That's a good question, isn't it? Because someone wrote into the Torah, of course with his own hand, listen to the words. It is not because of righteousness that the Lord God has given to you this good land to inherit it. It is not because of righteousness. For you are a stiff-necked people. It's in the Torah, meaning the land is ours unconditionally. Whether we are righteous or we are not. Whether we worship the Lord or we don't. Whether we observe the Sabbath or we don't. Whether we eat pork or we don't. The land is ours. That's false. Because you were thrown out of the land. And it's time for you to recognize if you have any piety in your heart and if you have any respect for the intellect and for the rational faculty to accept what Islam is saying to you that your book was rewritten. If you do that, you can save yourself from the greatest tragedy of all, which is around the corner. While they were in Babylon, Allah sent messengers to them, prophets, amongst whom was Isaiah. Who communicated to them a divine promise that Allah was going to send a prophet who would be their prophet and he would be known as the Messiah Al-Masih and he would bring back the golden age in Bahasa they call it Zaman Mas, the golden age. When Israel, holy Israel, was an incomparable state. Ruling the world, just look at the story of the Queen of Saba. The ruling state in the world. What is the definition of a ruling state? A ruling state does not have to rule every square inch of KLCC and choke it and um, uh, uh, book it in the... No, 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 no. A ruling state is a state whose power and influence over the whole world cannot be rivaled cannot be challenged by any other state or any combination of states. In this sense of the word Israel was the ruling state of the world. So please don't bother me by sending me an email saying that Israel didn't rule over China. <laughs> You're misunderstanding the subject. Israel was a ruling state in the world in this sense of the word of a ruling state. 
and the divine promise was that the Messiah will bring back that golden age the Messiah will rule the world from Jerusalem and therefore from Holy Israel they understood that in order for this divine prophecy to be fulfilled this is logical deduction please don't ask me where is the Hadith this is logical deduction in order for the Messiah to fulfill this divine prophecy number one the Messiah will have to liberate the Holy Land which is now under Babylonian occupation number two the Messiah will have to bring the Israelite people back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own at this time they are in slavery in Babylon number three these are logical deductions number three the Messiah will have to restore the Holy State of Israel and number four the Messiah will have to cause that Holy State of Israel to become once again the ruling state of the world and incidentally because the Babylonians had destroyed the Masjid Masjid Al-Aqsa the Messiah will have to rebuild the Masjid so they're waiting now for the fulfillment of this divine prophecy and lo and behold the Persian Empire defeated Babylon and the Persian Emperor allowed the Jews to return to the Holy Land which was now liberated of Babylonian occupation and not only allowed but assisted them in reconstructing the Masjid so there was electricity in the air all of Banu Israel are expecting the Messiah he must be around the corner and sure enough he was around the corner <laughs> but when he came Allah sent him in a manner that would test you know there are some people who see with two eyes eh? two and there are many 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 even with the university degrees they see with only one eye <laughs> yes so Allah sent Allah sent the Messiah in a manner that would test them as we are being tested today with something I don't know whether you've ever seen it it's called uh, paper money so Allah sent the Messiah as a son of a virgin mother and they missed the bus وَبِكُفْرِهِمْ وَقَوْلِهِمْ عَلَى مَرْيَمَ بُخْطَانًا عَظِيمًا they hurled this monstrous slur on the fair name of Mary, Maryam alayhi salam that she had committed that vile act and that this child who was born was, excuse the language, a bastard but when the child was growing up he was a great embarrassment for them the whole establishment was shaking with embarrassment because a little child was growing up and doing things which they could not do and they said we are the chosen people of the Lord heaven is reserved for us we have direct dialing with the Lord and this child would take mud 
and shape it in the form of birds and blow into it and by Allah's leave they became living birds and fly away and this miracle is in the other gospels up to this day but those gospels were excluded when the, th the four were chosen and canonized Matthew, Mark, Luke and John but the other gospels confirm what is in the Quran <laughs> so the child was embarrassing them and so the mother had to take him away we don't know where but I was reliably informed when I was a student in Egypt when you were not born as yet that he was taken to Egypt Allah knows best when he became an adult he returned and upon his return I'm cutting cutting short because of time he proclaimed himself to be the Messiah but they rejected him how can you be the Messiah when you are the a bastard they rejected him and because he claimed to be the Messiah they held a kangaroo court and sentenced him to death and forced the hand of the Roman government to execute him and when they saw him die on the cross before their very eyes they saw him die they boasted he can't be the Messiah he's dead he never ruled the world the golden age never came back and he's dead him if this was not in the Quran they would arrest me <laughs> when I was in, in New York for 10 years him in this is sarcastic language inna qatalna al-masiha masiha isa ibn maryam rasulallah we have killed him the messiah the son of mary the messenger of allah all of this they rejected what they did not know and what no one knew for 600 years allah in his wisdom kept it as a secret as he kept that other secret the fellow who was drowning and underneath the water he realized that he's not god before this he was saying Ana rabbukumul a'la. i am the lord most high but now underneath the water while he was drowning he suddenly realized he was not god and he declared his faith in the god of banu israel allah kept it a secret what happened underneath the water and for 600 years Allah kept this a secret that no they did not kill him no they did not crucify him Allah made it appear like that and Allah raised him so he is not in heaven no 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 he is in the Samawat in the parallel universes of space and time where you do not grow old women don't need cosmetics even you spend a thousand years in the summer what when you return you will still be the same age as when you go in there so one day he's going to come back because he did not ex listen carefully to my words he did not experience mouth 
The definition of maut is when Allah takes the soul and does not return it. That is maut. But if Allah takes the soul, is the footballer, was it in France two weeks ago? And for 78 minutes or so, he was dead. <laughs> if Allah takes the soul, Allah can return the soul. It's there in Surah Al-Zumar. Allah yatawaffa al-anfu sahida mawtiha wa allati lam tamud fi manamiha fa yumsiku allati qada alayha al-maut wa yursilu al-ukhra ila ajalim musamma. Allah can return the soul. So that's what happened here. He did not experience maut. No. So one day he's going to come back. And when he comes back, very interesting things are going to happen in the Holy Land. But because they were now, ex they were now engaged in a second period of fasad. They were killing the prophets of Allah. It's not just boasting about how they killed Nabi Isa alayhi salam through crucifixion. I wish I had the time to explain to you why they wanted him to be crucified. But also look at Yahya, look at Zakaria alayhi salam. Remember him going into the mihrab? And then the angel speaking to him, you're going to have a son and Allah has chosen the name Yahya for him. They killed him. In the masjid, Yahya alayhi salam, and by intrigue, and his head was cut off. Uh, this book, Jerusalem and the Quran, gives you a more detailed story of this than I can give you in this lecture. This is the second period of facade without a shadow of a doubt. We have the greatest respect for men like uh, Sheikh Muhammad Matawalli al Sha'arawi, Rahimahullah, and others who have a different opinion. But we say without a shadow of a doubt, this is the second period of fasad because this was followed with the second expulsion. That's why. The first time it was a Babylonian army, and this time it is a Roman army. And not only are they expelled, but the masjid is also destroyed a second time. Exactly as at the beginning of Surah Al Isra. So, your homework, if you're new to the subject, is go to Surah Al Isra. Surah number 17 of the Quran, wherever in New World are you listening to me? But upon this second expulsion from the Holy Land, because of the violation of the condition of the grant of the land, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now did two things which were different from the first time. First of all, he broke them up into bits and pieces and scattered them all over the world. Our subject is the Quran and Palestine this is what we're talking about. We broke them up into bits and pieces and scattered them all over the world. This was divine punishment. But they are a clever people. They say, no, this was the divine way of getting us to reach the message of the Lord all over the world. Allah did something else. And that is in Surah Al-Anbiya. And it is perhaps the most important passage of the Quran for our talk tonight. Listen to the Quran. Ba'da'uza billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim. Wa haramun ala qaryatin ahlaknaha أنهم لا يرجعون حتى 
Da. Ida futihat ya ajuju wa ma'jud futihat 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 not ba'atha futihat Ida futihat ya ajuju wa ma'jud wa hum min kulli halabin yansilun Allah speaks about a town or a city and he does not identify it by name alhamdulillah that he did not identify it by name Alhamdulillah that Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam did not identify it by name. Allah speaks of a town or a city which he destroyed. And having destroyed that town or city, wa haramun ala qariyatin, a town or a city. The people of the town or the city were expelled and then there is a ban placed on them that they could never return. Never return. Double A. Never return to reclaim this town or city as their own. You can come back as tourists, but you cannot come back to reclaim this town or city as your own. Hatta. Until, until when? Until akhirul zaman. Until akhirul zaman. In Islam, we say that history is not without end. Washington, you can say what you want. Oxford University, you can say what you want. But we say there's an end to history. It is not endless. And the end of history will witness. The end of history will witness the triumph of truth over falsehood. That end of history is the last age, Akhirul Zaman. And in Akhirul Zaman, it is like in Egypt. Allah will send signs. For Pharaoh, there were nine. You know the nine, don't you? I'm not going to test you tonight, don't worry. There were nine out there. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam spoke of ten major signs. The rest they call minor signs. I don't find anything minor about them, incidentally. Women are dressed and yet naked. Is that minor? Women are dressed like men. Is that minor? Men dressing like women so the beard goes, is that minor? <laughs> number one, Dajjal. Number two, Gog and Magog. Number three, the return of the son of Mary. Mirza Ghulam Ahmad was the son of a Punjabi woman, incidentally. Number four, Dukhan or smoke. Number five, Dabatul Ark, beast of the earth. Number six, that the sun would rise from the west. Number seven, eight, and nine, three, Khusuf. Three earthquakes would result in the sinking of the earth and the earth swallowing what it swallows, one in the east, one in the west, and the third one in Tamansuri, UK. <laughs> no, <laughs> the third one, you remember Tamansuri, UK? A couple of years ago, the whole house went down. The third one in Arabia, and that's one connected with Imam Mahdi. And number 10, the one that the State Department in Washington, they don't like this one at all. A fire will come out of Yemen. Driving people to their place of assembly. This is Akhirul Zaman. And this is the part of the lecture which comes after Salatul Isha. So don't go away. وَحَرَامٌ عَلَىٰ قَرْيَةٍ أَهْلَكْنَاهَا أَنَّهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ حَتَّى إِذَا فُتِحَتْ يَأْجُوجُ وَمَأْجُوجُ وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَلَبٍ يَنْسِرُونَ So Allah has destroyed the town and expelled the people of the town and placed a ban on them that they can never return. No. Until Gog and Magog are released and they spread out in all directions and with their indestructible power they take control of the world. One last thing before the Azan. Allah now addresses them and says, Wa in udna. 
two words with the preparation three, preposition three. And these three words are the most important words in the whole Quran, connected with the subject of the destiny of Palestine and Jerusalem and the Holy Land. These two words, maybe three. وَإِنْ عُدْتُمْ عُدْنَا If you return with your facade, we will return with our punishment. The first time it was a Babylonian army that was used to destroy your power. The second time it was a Roman army which was used to destroy the power. And the third time, Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam said, this is not the whole answer, this is part of the answer. There's also the alliance with Rome, let's not forget that. You'll most certainly fight the Jews. And you'll most certainly defeat them. At that time even the stones will speak. This is the ethical, the ethical predicament of the Jews today. This is the ethical predicament. That at that time even the stones will speak. Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam is speaking to you. Will you not listen? Ya Muslim. As a Yehudiyun wa ra'ifata ala faktu. There's a Jew hiding behind me, so come and kill him. It is lazy methodology to believe that the Prophet is speaking about all Jews. That's lazy methodology. No, he's not. He's only speaking about those Jews who are oppressors. And inshallah, we'll continue the lecture after Salat al-Maghrib. Salat al-Isha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spoken about a town which is destroyed, people expelled, a ban placed on them, they can never return. To reclaim that town as their own. Until Gog and Magog are released. And they spread out in all directions. And so with their indestructible power, they take control of the world. Which town is it? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a warning. If you return with your facade, I will return with my punishment. The first time, because of a violation of the condition of righteousness, they were expelled. A Babylonian army must have destroyed. The second time, because of a violation of the condition of righteousness, they were expelled. A Roman army must have destroyed. The Umam and they are broken up into bits and pieces. And so Jews in Argentina, and Jews in Russia, and Jews in China, and Jews in Morocco, and Jews in Yemen, all over the world. But now they're back. Oh yes, they are. We began with the verse of Surah Al-Nahl in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says بَعَدْعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَنَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ تِبِيَانًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةً وَبُشْرًا لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ We have sent down the book on thee, O Muhammad Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam That this book might explain all things And therefore that this book Might explain The momentous events That will unfold in the world In connection with the destiny of Jerusalem and the Holy Land, which is the sign of all signs of Akhiru Zaman. Wa innahu suratu zukhraf. Wa innahu la. In Arabic is ain, lam, and mean. 
and that can be read as ilm and it can also be read as alam both are possible with the same spelling whichever one you want the second one of course is more powerful and more consistent with the context but if you insist no problem who is the who Nabi alayhi salam that his return would be the sign of all signs the mother of all signs of akhir zaman and so this book must explain those events in order for the false messiah the Dajjal to successfully impersonate the true messiah he must rule the world from Jerusalem from a state of Israel which must be the ruling state in the world do I need to repeat that? it's simple it's elementary common sense and therefore he would also have to do the following logical deduction don't ask me for the hadith number one the holy land is under Muslim rule from the Jewish perspective it is occupied by the Muslims and so he will have to liberate the holy land for the Jews but he's already done that 1917 at the end of 1917 the Jews experienced the liberation quote unquote of the Holy Land from our perspective it's now occupied <laughs> number two he would have to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own he's already done that they have returned to the Holy Land while we were eating roti chanai and drinking tetari and they have occupied the re regained control over the Holy Land number three he would have to restore a state of Israel in the Holy Land and get the Jews to believe that this is holy Israel he's already done that this state of Israel came into being thanks to the United Nations organization created by a mysterious European Jewish Christian Alliance and we have more to talk about that in a moment or rather the Quran will have more to talk about that in a moment the state of Israel was born in 1948 if you have another explanation I love to hear it this is my explanation if you have another I'd love to hear it this book was written more than 10 years ago Jerusalem and the Quran are we still waiting for the world of Islamic scholarship to respond to it should we give them another 20 years the state of Israel has grown in power thanks to the United Nations Security Council and to endless American vetoes in the Security Council the state of Israel is now a nuclear armed state thermonuclear armed state the state of Israel is now poised to replace the United States of America as the next ruling state in the world while Islamic scholarship is still eating roti chanai and drinking tetari
It should not be long. If the attack takes place on Iran, you will see the events which will follow. Like a script. What is the explanation for these events which have already unfolded in the world? Who brought the Jews back to the Holy Land? Which town is it that Allah is speaking about? Using my methodology, which I got from my teacher of blessed memory, Mawlana Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah, and you'll find that methodology explained in my book on an Islamic view of Gog and Magog in the modern world, chapter 3 on methodology, and the book is outside somewhere on a table. I came to the conclusion while I was in New York about 16, 18 years ago that the town is Jerusalem. Having come to that conclusion, I then found out that it is also the opinion of my teacher, <laughs> expressed in a book which was published by Ibrahim Bawani, Rahimahullah, in 1958, I believe, on Gog and Magog and Israel. And then I found out that this was also the opinion of Dr. Muhammad Iqbal in a very famous Urdu couplet of his. The town is Jerusalem. And so Allah speaks about Jerusalem. And he says he has destroyed it. And expelled the Jews. And broke them up into bits and pieces. And placed a ban on them that they can never return. Until Gog and Magog are released. And they spread out in all directions. 2,000 years after they were expelled, the Jews are back in the Holy Land. Is it possible that the Quran is silent on this? Is it possible that there is no explanation in the Quran of the return of the Jews to the Holy Land 2,000 years after they were expelled? Is it possible that there is no explanation in the Quran and Hadith about the restoration of a state of Israel in the Holy Land? Is it possible that there is nothing we have in Islam that will explain the growth of Israel to a super state poised to rule the world? Is it possible that the Quran and Hadith is silent? My answer is no. My Salafi brothers, and they are my brothers, and I am not with boxing gloves on. Look at my hands, there are no boxing gloves. This is an academic discussion, this is an intellectual discussion, no need to be enemies. Salafi Islamic scholarship insists with adamant insistence. That only Allah and His Messenger and the Aslaf can interpret the Quran and the Ahadith. And if they have not identified the town as Jerusalem, no one can do it. No one can do it. I'm not going to argue. I'm going to leave them where they are and move on. Move on. Because this methodology is explaining the world today, the reality of the world today, and mankind is recognizing that. We say that this is the work of Dajjal. And that when Israel becomes the ruling state in the world tomorrow, replacing the United States, then a man is going to emerge in Jerusalem. Nabi Muhammad والسلام, described that man to us 1400 years ago. He would be a Jew, born of Jewish parents. He would be a young man. So the young are going to rule the world tomorrow. He will be powerfully built. He would have curly hair. 
but we'll skip the eyes for this for the for the time being and in Jerusalem he is going to declare I am the Messiah and all of these that we are now witnessing are events which are unfolding which will allow him to stand up in Jerusalem ruling over an Israel which will be the ruling state in the world which is around the corner and declaring that I am the Messiah and when he does that they will the Zionists will accept him as the Messiah but what about those who insist that only Allah and his messenger and the Aslaf only they can interpret they will say but no you cannot be the Messiah you cannot be Dajjal he is Dajjal but they will show you you cannot be Dajjal why? because you are seeing with two eyes and our prophet said that Dajjal will see with one eye he'll be blind in the right eye it'll look like a bulging grip so you cannot be Dajjal I urge you to read the chapter my book entitled Suratul Kaf and the Modern Age because Suratul Kaf is the Surah of Akhiru Zaman but you cannot study Suratul Kaf with one eye you gotta study with two you cannot be Dajjal because Dajjal is going to ride on a donkey the donkey will travel as fast as the clouds the donkey will have his ears stretched out wide where is your flying donkey? unless we see your flying donkey we will not recognize you as Dajjal I can go on with many more you know there are hadiths I can go to but we will say this is the judge and it is at that time after he has made his declaration I am the Messiah that Nabi Isa alayhi salam will come down with his hand resting on the wings of two angels we have more knowledge of this subject than the Pope in Rome and he's going to kill the judge and then Gog and Magog are going to be sent, not released. Gog and Magog are going to be sent, not released. For Ba'ath Allahu Ya'juj wa Ma'juj. In Sahih Muslim, the hadith. For Ba'ath Allahu is a futihat. That is Futihat Ya'juj wa Ma'juj. And this is Ba'ath Allahu. That is the release. And this is Allah will send Gog and Magog. And for this, we got to go to Surah Al Kaf. We got to go to the story of Zulkarnain and study that carefully. At that time, the Holy Land is going to be liberated. At that time, Muslims are going to liberate it. And I quoted the Hadith, which is in Sahih Bukhari, which is in Sahih Muslim. I don't need the Hadith from Khurasan. I don't need it. It's there. But because they say it's weak Hadith and so on, I don't need it, the Hadith from Khurasan because I have this one, it is in Sahih Bukhari, it is in Sahih Muslim, it is Muttafiqun Alayh La tuqatilunna al-Yahud wa la taqtulunnahum ila akhil al-Hadith so a Muslim army will liberate the Holy Land at that time but prior to that what are the events that are going to take place? when Dajjal is released, he'll live on earth for 40 days 40 days and this is not 37 plus 3 make 40 a man asked the Prophet which is the first masjid built he said the Kaaba which is the second he said Masjid Al-Aqsa how much time elapsed between them thousands of years between them. he said 40 years this is symbolic language he said 40 years 
That's not 40 years, it's thousands of years between the two. How can you say 40? He is saying 40 to tell you 40 years is symbolic in nature. So when the Dajjal is released, he live on earth for 40 days. One day like a year, one day like a month, one day like a week. I'm sorry I have to speed up, speed up this much now. And all his days, meaning all the rest of his days, like your days. One entire chapter of my book, Surah al Kaf in the Modern Age. You can go to my website and download all of these books free of charge. You have no excuse. It's entitled The Quran and Time. The Quran and Time. And this book, this chapter explains this hadith. A day like a year, a day like a month, a day like a week. I don't have the time to explain it to you now. But I came to the conclusion that the emergence of Britain as a ruling state in the world was because Britain was the island of the Hadith of Tamim Udari. So they come after me. Hey, Sheikh Imran, you didn't study geography in school? Huh? You didn't study geography in Trinidad and Tobago? The Prophet pointed 20 times to the east. The Jal will come from the east and Britain is in the west. Go back and study your geography. <laughs> Tell them to go and study my chapter on the Quran and time and they'll get the answer there. Britain emerges as the ruling state in the world with a mysterious relationship, an obsession with the Holy Land. Britain gives the Balfour Declaration in 1917. Britain assumes a mandate over the Holy Land from 1918 to 1948. Britain acts as a midwife for the birth of Israel in 1948. And Britain rules the world, Pax Britannica. And Britain attacks with money, with money, the Bank of England. And the sterling pound, which becomes a piece of paper. Sterling pound used to be a gold coin. Oh yes. And then mysteriously, a day like a, a year gives way to a day like a month. And Pax Americana takes over from Pax Britannica. And the United States has a mysterious relationship with the Holy Land and Israel that you cannot explain with tools of political analysis. Forget it, you're wasting your time. Only eschatology can explain that. The relationship between the United States and Israel, the relationship between Britain and Israel. And the US dollar takes over from the sterling palm. And then in 1971, while we were, you know, drinking our Te Tariq and eating our Roti Chennai, that's Islamic scholarship today. My, my language is harsh. Yes, my language is harsh. Something happened in 1971, which fulfilled the hadith of Akhiru Zaman, about the river Euphrates and the mountain of gold when the US dollar became a petrodollar. Go to my lecture which is on YouTube and listen to that lecture. And now the United States is declining. Using my methodology of study of the Quran and the Hadith, more than 15 years ago, I declared, not because some angel was whispering into my ear, not because I was getting dreams and visions, stop this nonsense, please. It was because of analysis of the data in front of me. That analysis led me to the conclusion, the US dollar must collapse. And the U.S. economy must collapse. And the United States will have to give way to another state. As a ruling state in the world. Anybody who knows Imran Hussein would know. That I have been saying this for 15 years or more. Why? Because of my methodology. 
not because of some secret person I have whispering into my ears you're not going to get rid of me with that nonsense and now it's there the US dollar will collapse as soon as they attack Iran Obama knows that the US economy is going to collapse maybe before the end of this year and when Israel attacks Iran it's going to be the cue for a number of wars a number of wars and Zionist control over the world is going to tighten they want Egypt they want Egypt why? because the Bible says that the Holy Land extends from part of Egypt part of Egypt take a look and see where the Israeli embassy is in Egypt in Cairo go take a look so they have to attack Egypt you can't do it from the air alone and the sea you need ground 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 invasion so you need NATO in Libya you need NATO in Libya and these fools now they recognize their mistake now they're crying yeah I call them fools made an alliance with NATO you're telling me about Gaddafi is a dictator and this and that and that and that and that and save yourself I know many other dictators I know others who have done far more betrayal than him and you went and made an alliance with NATO so NATO now is going to attack Egypt from the west and Israel from the east they want Iran why not just because of the the capacity to build nuclear weapons more than that it will be more convenient to them to have a militantly Shia regime in Iran rather than this regime which is anti-Zionist so they can make a deal with a future regime in in Iran 70,000 Jews will follow the Dajjal from Isfahan so they want this regime out of the way they have to attack Pakistan because no Muslim country must have weapons with which they can threaten Israel and when they attack Pakistan they have to break it up to ensure that Pakistan could no longer rise up as a power all of these wars are coming now what do we do how do we respond I only have how much three or four more minutes but I hope maybe in the question and answer session I can expand what is our strategy how do we respond the liberation of the Holy Land will not take place with the help of any army of any state Egyptian armed forces forget it Pakistani armed forces forget it they are all controlled by the Security Council of the United Nations if the Security Council of the United Nations says stop fighting you have to stop fighting don't believe me take a look at the Charter the Holy Land will be liberated by Mujahideen not by these armed forces and the Mujahideen will have to fight in the context of Darul Islam Darul Islam and so the modern secular state you can go and vote in elections if you want you go your way I'm not going that way I prefer to struggle for the restoration of Darul Islam and the Khilafah because that is the road to liberation and to power can you liberate Jerusalem while you're still using this uh, I don't know see it paper money forget it Dajjal is the author of the paper money and the paper money came into the world if you don't know it because you've not studied international monetary economics it came in the world to enslave you and to imprison you that's the political and economic analysis that I had to dispose in one minute I'm sorry about that but there is an alliance which comes before the Muslim army liberating Jerusalem and the alliance with Rome Hadith is that you make an alliance with Rome a sulh a peace treaty is a form of an alliance 
It is not hudna, it is not a truce, it is sulh, it is a peace treaty with Rome. Who is Rome? Rome used to be in Italy, the Holy Roman Empire in Italy. No, the Roman Empire in Italy, sorry. And then I think it was Constantine. If we have any Bulgarians here or Turks over here, they can correct me. Any Turkish students? Constantine, who transferred Rome to Constantinople. And so this is the second room, Constantinople. And when the Prophet والسلام, said that you will conquer Constantinople, and what a great Amir that would be, and what a great Jaish that would be, he is referring to Constantinople. And when the Quran says Gulibatir Rum, the Quran is referring to the second room, Constantinople, not the first one in Italy. But there's a third room. When the Ottoman, the Osmanli, conquered Constantinople, then a third room came into being, and that room was in Russia. Moscow is the third room, if you didn't know it. Do your homework. And the conquest of Constantinople, which is in the Hadith, my opinion, I hope Turkey is listening, could not be the one that took place in 14, what it was, with the Sultan Fatih, Mehmet. Hmm. No, I can't say that he is that Sultan. Wana Ni'mal Amir. Amir. No, why? Let me tell you why. He knows, and all those with him, they know of the hadith that you will make an alliance with Rome. They know it. They know that the heart of Rome, which is a Christian civilization, is Hagia Sophia, the masjid, the, the temple, the, the, the church the, in, in Constantinople. They call it Hagia Sophia. The Osmanis change it to Hagia Sophia. This is the heart of Rome. When Umar in, entered Jerusalem, the Archbishop offered him to perform his Salat in the Masjid. He declined. Every Muslim knows that. He said, if I were to perform my Salat in this church, after me Muslims will come and take over this church and transform it into a Masjid. And I, I'm not going to allow that. So we have to respect the church. Guess what this conqueror did? As soon as he conquered Constantinople, it was a shameful thing. It was an embarrassing thing. And I have to live with that embarrassment. He took Hagia Sophia and transformed it into a masjid and plunged a dagger into the heart of Rome. If ever we take over Constantinople tomorrow, one of the first things we'll do in the name of Islam is to return that church to the Christians. The second thing we'll do is to offer an apology to them for this shameful act, unworthy of Muslims. That alliance with Rome, which is Moscow, is going to come. And it is with that alliance that the backbone is going to be broken of modern Western civilization. And when Gog and Magog have the clash, mutual destruction, that will pave the way for the Muslim army, which will liberate Jerusalem. I'm sorry I had to squeeze in all of this in the last part of the lecture, but hopefully you'll go to my books and go to my lectures on YouTube and my website to get in that which I could not uh, give you tonight. The question is what 
is the relationship between the subject of time and our faith. The world of time is also connected with the world of space. Zaman, Makan. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks on the subject in the Quran. And faith of course resides in part in faith in the Quran. Hmm? So to the extent that the Quran speaks about space and time, it is a part of our faith. After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the material universe and the material universe extends beyond the earth, ثُمَّ اسْتَوَى إِلَى السَّمَاءِ فَسَوَّاهُنَّ سَبَعَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَهُوَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ He then directed his attention to the sky and he fashioned it into seven parallel universes. Tabakan an tabak, one beside the other. You cannot understand the subject of Dajjal, which is pivotal to the understanding the reality of the world today. Unless you understand the Samawat. The Prophet والسلام, suspected a Jewish boy whose name was Ibn Sayyad in Medina to be Dajjal. And he took Umar عنه, with him to question the boy. The boy was very impertinent in his answers. And Umar said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, give me permission. I'll cut off his head. No, said the Prophet. If he is Dajjal, if he is Dajjal, what's that? If he is Dajjal, a boy in Medina, you cannot use that language if he is Dajjal unless Dajjal has been released. Elementary common sense. If he is Dajjal, you cannot kill him. And if he is not Dajjal, it will be sinful to kill him. This is an indirect, indirect information giving to us that Dajjal has been released. He is on earth. He'll be here for 40 days. Where is he if he is released? In a day which is like a year. That cannot be our world of space and time, not the material universe. So it has to be the Samawat. Is it possible for you to be in the Samawat and also on earth? Is it possible for you to be in the Samawat and also on earth? Oh yes. Are there angels here? Are there angels here? Those of you who are married apart from your wives, are there angels here? Yes, of course. <laughs> on your shoulders. Can you see them? No. Because they are on earth but they are in the summer what? They are on earth but they are in the summer what? Are there jinn here? Yes. Can you see them? No. They are on earth but they are in the summer what? Surah al -Kaf, the story of the young man in the cave. And I don't have the time because we, the time is running up. Surah Tulkaf, the story of the young man in the cave, gives us the importance of the subject of time and space. That they are constantly moving for 300 years between that world and this world. So they are in that world and also in this world. 
That's the job. Next question. Where are you from? Tajikistan. Tajikistan. They study history out there in Tajikistan. <laughs> I have not heard any government in the Muslim world, any political leader in the Muslim world with the courage, with the courage to do what Western scholarship has done. Lots of scholars in the Western world have done, namely questioning this six million figure, hmm? the Holocaust. I found only one and he's not Sunni. Like me, I am Sunni, but he's not Sunni. He's the president of Iran. And he had the courage to do it. And guess where he did it? In the General Assembly of the United Nations Organization. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you, my brother. I'm proud of you. Yes. They can say what they want. But he's the only one who stood up and did what Western scholarship is doing. Did Germany have a role to play in the exodus of the Jews to the Holy Land? I don't know whether Adolf Hitler did it wittingly or unwittingly, but certainly the Zionist movement was playing a game with Hitler. The Zionist movement wanted that kind of bloodletting in Europe that will cause the Jews, the European Jews to become scared and flee and exodus and they use Hitler for that purpose. But Britain played an even more important role in that sorry spectacle in getting the Jews to flee to Palestine. Hmm? Um, I would like to advise all of you, in addition to your study in, in engineering, in medicine, whatever it is you are studying, do please take some time and read history. Do please take some time and read history. Next question. Yeah. How do we activate the internal eye? First of all, remember the internal eye by itself is not enough. When Musa alayhi salam said, I want to meet him, the one who is more learned than me, Allah directed him to, to where? Majma'ul Bahrain. Majma'ul Bahrain. Imam Bailawi rahimahullah says, Majma'ul Bahrain. The meeting of the two oceans is the ocean of knowledge externally acquired and the ocean of knowledge internally received. When these two oceans of knowledge combine together and are harmoniously integrated, then you have the most learned of all men. You have the man who is walking in the footsteps of Khidr alayhi salam and he's the only one. He is the only one who can recognize the reality of the world in Akhirul Zaman. How do we awaken the internal eye? Surah An-Nur, ayah number 35. Allahu nur as samawati wal ab. Number one, faith. And when you have faith, Allah will test you. And he's tested the fellows in Brooklyn. And they said, Lord, we have faith in you, we'll live for you, we'll die for you, we'll give up everything for you, but not our American passport. That we can't give up. Not our green card, that we can't give up. We can't make hijra. If he, Muhammad Islam, he want to make hijra, that's him, but we're not leaving. This is home. <laughs> you are tested and you fail. It's when you are tested and you pass the test that Allah will place nur in your heart. But then uh, when faith enters into the heart, then Allah puts a lamp. There's a hollow space, mishkat, fiha misbah, a lamp. 
A lamp has a glass around it. The glass has to be polished, cleaned. This is called tezkiya. It is a kikum. Clean the glass. Polish it with zikr. And then you need oil. The oil has to be the purest oil. That oil can only be produced if وَكُلِنَّ الصَّلَاةِ وَنُسُكِ وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ وَبِذَلِكَ أُمِلْتُ أَنَا أَوَّلُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ So when you strive and struggle in Allah's way, you sacrifice, sacrifice in Allah's way, and He sees and He accepts it, then he will put the noor in your heart and then you'll be able to see with the internal eye. Next question. I want to get out of riba. What should I do? My house, you know, with the mortgage. If I sell it and I make a profit, what do I do? If I have land, can I buy the land with the money, sell for the house? But first of all, my view is that all paper money is haram and therefore every single transaction using paper money is haram but i have the paper money yes and it pains me i cannot get out of the paper money unless and until i can succeed in building a market which will prohibit the use of the paper money and the other money which is coming after what is even worse than the paper money electronic money my students in Malaysia some of them are here have already bought land and are clearing the land mashallah 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 to build a Muslim village and in that village, insha'Allah, we have a market. And we eat the food that we produce, no supermarket food. No, we eat the food that we produce. So our children will be fed with the food and the milk and the meat that we produce. And in that village, we have a micro market that market will use sunnah money sunnah money gold and silver coins the articles of agreement of the international monetary fund prohibit the use of gold as money so they made haram what Allah made halal and that is shirk they've made haram what Allah made halal and that is shirk so we defy them and we use dinar and dirham so if you sell your house and you are paid in paper money, it's still a haram transaction. <laughs> All right? But sell your house, take whatever you get from the sale of the house and buy land in the remote countryside. And when you buy the land in the remote countryside, then you try to build a village and build a village in which Islam would be lived. Allah does not ask of you that which lies beyond your capacity. In Surah Al-Taghabun, Ittaqullaha mastata'atum. There are credible reports indicating that Saudi Arabia and other pro-Western Gulf states, including Qatar, are actively fueling the conflict in Syria. I don't need credible reports for that anybody who have eyes to see and five ringgits word of common sense would know it that's all you need five ringgits word of common sense that they are fueling the conflict in Syria what they want to do in Syria is what they have done in Libya NATO is now in Libya NATO is the military arm of Zionism and NATO is now in Libya and NATO is not going to leave Libya for another 25 years 
thanks to those fools. They want Syria to become another Libya. I am not a defender of either the former Libyan government or the present Syrian government, so don't waste your time with me. I'm not defending them. But I pray every day, O oh Allah, please save Syria from becoming another Zionist state, like Libya. What is your advice to the Syrians, particularly the Sunni community of Syria? I have already done that. I've been getting so many emails from Syria. Sheikh, say something, we're listening to you. I have said, I suspect it's only a matter of time before the Zionists succeed. I suspect it's only a matter of time. It's called the policy of attrition. But if Islamic scholarship, Sunni Islamic scholarship in Syria, of course the Saudis and the Qataris will hate this. If you can convince Russia, Putin, convince him that a change of regime in Syria to allow the Sunni to replace the Alawi and that this regime would not be subservient to the Zionists that this regime in Syria will continue the present relations that Syria has with Russia and with Iran then Putin can do it he can cause Bashar Assad to step down and his regime to step down because Russia has a tremendous stake in Syria if the Zionists can succeed in Syria the Russians are going to lose a naval base in Syria and that's the only naval base that they have in the Mediterranean any more questions <laughs> If, if the knowledge of epistemology in Mu'akhir Zaman is so important, why is it not taught in our universities in the world of Islam? Yes. I, I, I can only answer you and say this much, that if Allah in His kindness allows me I'm not a university professor. If I get a job in a university, I'll probably be fired within one month. It is my intention, inshallah, to establish a mahad, an institute of Islamic eschatology. Hmm? You cannot, you cannot grasp Islamic eschatology without the proper methodology for the study of the Quran and Hadith. I'll give you an example. One example. Bear with me, Brother Chairman. O you who have faith, do not take the Jews, and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. Is Allah speaking about all Jews and all Christians? If you use the wrong methodology, you will assume it's all Jews and all Christians. But if you use the correct methodology, you know it's not all Jews and all Christians. Then which Jews and which Christians? You ask. And the answer is right there. Do not take such Jews and such Christians as your friends and allies who themselves, who themselves, who themselves are friends and allies of each other. The Quran is saying that the time is going to come when part of the Christian and part of the Jewish world are going to come together in friendship and alliance. When that happens, you are prohibited from being friends and allies of that Jewish Christian alliance. And if you become their friends and allies, 
as those fools in Libya did. You lose your Islam. That alliance is coming to being today. It is the Zionist European Jewish Christian Alliance, which today controls the American Congress. So you must have the proper methodology for the study of the Quran and Hadith. If you want to grasp Islamic eschatology, you must study international politics. You must study international economics. You must study international monetary economics. You have to study comparative religion. So many different subjects. So that multidisciplinary um, scholarship has not come from our Darul Loom, has not come from Al Azhar University. And so we don't have the teachers to teach it. Let me give only one because we run out of time and I don't want the chairman to stop me. In order for Israel to rule the world, not only must these wars be waged, Egypt to take the eastern delta from Egypt, Iran to replace that government and to take control of the oil, <coughs> Pakistan to destroy the nuclear plants and nuclear weapons, but and also and also civil war in Turkey, civil war in Turkey for the conquest of Constantinople, which is a in time, Achilu Zaman conquest of Constantinople. But in order for United States to replace Britain as a ruling state in the world, a big war had to be waged which brought Britain to the verge of defeat. And the United States had to intervene to save Britain from defeat in 1917. So we use analogical reasoning that in order for Israel to replace the United States as the ruling state in the world, Israel will have to trap the United States in a war or wars which will so weaken and overstretched the United States, which is why there was 9-11, so weaken the United States that when the final trap is set, that the United States will face military defeat. What could it be? If you've been listening to my lectures, you'd see my opinion, and I can be wrong that an Israeli attack on Iran would be meant to provoke Iran to take Bahrain, which is easy pickings. And once Iran takes Bahrain, Saudi Arabia will say that this is a threat to Saudi Arabia and invoke the treaty, the secret treaty. The United States will now have to land troops in Saudi Arabia. The US government would not want to do that. The U.S. armed forces would not want to do that, but the Congress, will, the Congress will force them to do it. And the United States could face defeat at the hands of Iran in Saudi Arabia. And the only thing in the world to save the United States from defeat would be an Israeli intervention. And so history would repeat itself. The way the United States intervened to save Britain, Israel intervenes to save the United States, and so it's clear to the world that Israel is now the ruling state in the world. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> Ahí
Rahim Allah faham beli taubat awfir dunubi fa inna ka ghafiru dhambi al-azim Tuhan ku aku tidak layak untuk syurga mu tetapi aku tidak pula sanggup menanggung siksa neraka Dari itu kurniakanlah ampunan kepadaku Ampunkanlah dosaku Sesungguhnya engkau lah pengampun dosa-dosa besar Tuhanku Tetapi aku tidak pula sanggup menanggung siksa neraka mu Dari itu kurniakanlah ampunan kepadaku Ampunkanlah dosaku Sesungguhnya engkau lah pengampun dosa-dosa besar Allah faham li taubat awfir dunubi fa inna ka ghafiru dhambi al-azim ilahi lastu lil firdausi ahla wa la Allah fahab li ta'awbat